I am just absolutely delighted to be sitting here and talking to my friend Frank Brudy, who I was a fan before I was a friend. Um, it's like in our profession, you don't really run into a lot of people about whom you might use the phrase, the hokey, hackneyed phrase, Renaissance man. But Frank uh, is that person. I mean, in the course of his career at the New York Times, which I think started in your mid-20s, right? N no, I can't remember. I think it was 30. Oh, it was a wow. long, long, long time ago, yes. yeah. <laughs> but listen to the range of this guy. Over the course of those years, he has been the White House correspondent. He has been the restaurant critic. He has been the Rome bureau chief. He has been an op-ed columnist. And now he continues to write for the Times from his new perch as, as a professor at Duke University. So he is now in academia. And in the course of this, he has written books on subjects that range from uh, a biography of George W. Bush, a look at the college admissions process, and a book about meatloaf. So. That was the passion project. <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to talk to him today both about his most recent book and one that he has in the works. So, Frank, let's talk about the beauty of dusk. Um, a few years back, you noticed that you suddenly had a vision problem. Could you describe sort of what, what transpired there? I can, but first I want to thank you so much uh, for being here with me. I am as big a fan of Karen. No, I'm a bigger no, fan no. of Karen than she is of me, and um, it means a lot to have you as a friend, and it means a lot to be here with a friend, so thank you very much. Um, and I'm a big fan of, of her work, and if you're not reading her regularly in the Washington Post, you need to start doing that because it will make your life better. Thank you. Um, I, um, I, the book comes out of an episode about five years ago. I woke up one morning, um, and uh, I couldn't see properly. So it was something strange and wrong with my vision. Um, and in the, in, the, in the course of several days, and visiting several doctors, I learned that I'd had a very rare stroke of the optic nerve behind my right eye, um, and that probably the vision in my right eye, which was useless, um, would never get better, and it, it indeed has not gotten better. Um, but I also learned at the same time that uh, statistically they believe about 20% of the time, if you are someone who has this happen in one eye, it tells them something about your anatomy, your physiology, whatever. There's a 20% chance it'll happen in the other eye. And so I remember, I mean, I went from no sign that this would happen, you know, there were no warnings, to, you know, four or five days afterwards being told that for the rest of my life I would live with a 20% chance that I'd go blind. Um, and I live with that to this day. And, um, you know, I mean, all of us, I think, in life have stories like that, or if we don't, we will. You know, we reach those junctures where something surprising and really challenging happens. Um, I at, at was am blessed uh, in being a writer, and I immediately started taking notes um, and, and filling, filling Word documents with what was going on and realized that one of the things I could do to make sense of this, to get through it, and to share the wisdom that I was acquiring from people around me with other people was right about it. And that's how the book came to be. And this is really, it's really a book about resilience, but it's also a book about exploration. Um, because as you are trying to figure out, and then again, this is a man who has made an absolute career out of being a keener observer than the rest of us. But it oddly enough seems to, as you're dealing with what most people would call a disability, it narrows, it, instead of narrowing your world, it seems to expand it. I, I realized afterwards, I mean, after this happened, um, that one of the first and most um, pernicious traps was, was going to be self-pity. You know, we all, something like this happens, you learn that it only happens to one in 10,000 people, you think, how am I one in that 10,000 people? Poor me, why me, you know? Um, and I think the thing you need to you need to do to get through something like that, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room have done it, um, is you need to realize the question is not why me, it's why not me. And I began to, talk to, to answer your question about exploration, I began looking in a new way at everybody around me, 
everybody like kind of a circle beyond them and realize that when you do a truly honest and accurate survey of the people you know and of the people you read about, almost everybody has been dealt some extremely formidable challenge. Um, most of these challenges are not visible to the naked eye. Um, and that's why we kind of forget it. You know, we talk a lot about what it does to our psyches that we're exposed all the time to these lacquered lives on social media, like to look at people's Instagrams, to look at their Facebook pages. Everyone is always at a wedding where the sun is setting and everyone looks great. And, and you know, these are real engines of envy, but that's not actually what's going on around you. And I, I decided to kind of make, make an adventure um, and to kind of make it almost like it was like an om almost homework assignment to begin interviewing the people around me about things they'd been through that I'd never asked them fully about before. And so the book is toggles back and forth between my story as I, as I try to adjust to this and, um, and the interviews I'm doing with and the wisdom I'm reaping from people around me. Well, there is a point in the book that, that really struck me where you are quoting a renowned neuroscientist who says, you don't see with the eyes, you see with the brain, which I thought was kind of a pretty uh, fundamental revelation here that I certainly had never thought about. Well, the funny thing is that's actually something of a double entendre because the optic nerve is, is technically part of your brain. It, it, it's where your kind of eye ends and your brain begins. Um, but it's also obviously metaphorically true. I, I see, I mean, I, my editor and I struggled a lot over the subtitle of the book, which I, I believe is on vision lost and found because it felt a little bit cliched and obvious to me. But we stuck with it because it's true. I see less clearly than I did before. Um, there are days when I still struggle because my right eye tries to get involved in the action that screws everything up. Um, I listen to more books than I read now. And when I read, I read more slowly. I write more slowly with more typos, all of that. Um, so I see less clearly, but I see much more clearly in the ways that matter. I was one of those people, shame, I'm, I'm ashamed of it, who was always tallying his slights, who could tell you about the ways in which I'd been shortchanged. Um, I am a totally different person now. Um, when I began looking in a more clear-eyed fashion, metaphorically, at the world, I began to realize and appreciate, as never before, how many advantages and blessings I've had. And I think, you know, if I recently had the honor of giving the commencement speech at my alma mater, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And what I told those students By is the way, this is, he teaches at Duke, and yeah. if anybody knows... Well, but I'm like, I'm Switzerland. I'm just, you know... <laughs> um, no, every time they play basketball, I get all these messages. What are you going to do? You must be torn. And I'm like, there are more important things in life than who I'm going to root for in the basketball game. But what I said to those students and said I wish someone had, had said to me is the kind of most important choice you're going to make in life is not your spouse, although that's really important, or your life partner. Um, it's not the job you choose to do. It's not where you live or what kind of house or apartment you buy. It's whether you're going to be one of those people um, who tallies your slights or who does an honest accounting and a grateful accounting of your blessings. Um, and there are all of these junctures in life when that decision is before us. And I was, and I, I'm so grateful for this because I think it's a triumph not of character but of just fortunate wiring, um, I found myself able to tally my blessings in a way I never had before. And I am strangely, and I know this sounds so Pollyanna, and I am strangely a person with a much better, with a much greater talent for happiness on the far side of this incident than I was before it. But in the meantime, you have things going on in, I mean, as you are dealing with this, life happens. You and your, your boyfriend break up, uh, you get a dog, you're dealing with COVID, not COVID having it, but COVID, you know, this, the lockdown life that we have all been living with. Uh, did this make it? harder or easier to keep things in perspective? Weirdly, it made it, I, I don't know if easier is the right word, but it had given me a kind of process and a way to think about things, you know, that helps me to this moment when I have a really bad day. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the dog. Um, she's but named Regan. Why did you name, why did your brother name a dog after Ronald Reagan's treasury? Yeah, so I, I figured, 
I, fig I, I figured if I was going to live, I'm going to answer that in, <laughs> in a slightly circuitous way. Um, I figured if I was going to um, live with a uh, much compromised, different, worse vision, and, and with the, this, a sword dangling over me that I might go blind, I figured I was going to work that for some things. <laughs> and I had always coveted and wanted to steal my brother's dog from him. And so I said, I, I, I'm going through a really rough period. You should give her to me now. And it worked. <laughs> so shameless. Um, but I mean, I, I, I devote a whole chapter of the book to her. So if, if, you, if you are thinking about looking at the book and you don't like dogs, skip chapter 9 or 10 or just skip the book altogether. Um, if you like dogs, I promise you it will be your favorite chapter. Um, and I did that. Um, because A, I wanted to just kind of shower love on, on something that come into my life and been so meaningful. But it was also kind of an example of the lessons I learned and the adjustments I made. Um, I no longer wanted to delay things that I was gonna get to do one day that I knew would bring me happiness because you don't know if you delay them, you know, that you'll ever get there. Um, I wanted I wanted to do something that was outward looking and expansive. I wanted not to look around for who was gonna take care of me. I wanted to take care of someone or something else. And there's something about that that was another lesson I learned that was really, really, I think getting that dog, loving that dog, um, making a commitment that I've kept to give that dog as good a life as I could has been as therapeutic as anything else. But at the same time, your, your father has reached a point in his life where he also needs some more care, some more caretaking. Yeah. And, you know, I, I get the sense that you are approaching that differently, too, than you might have otherwise. I think so. I mean, um, that one's kind of harder to get my head around. Um, my, my, my father has um, Alzheimer's. Um, and as I'm sure, uh, I think all of us have dealt with that um, with family in our lives. And, and, and that one almost seems to exist in a completely diff different sphere. It's so hard. That's such a peculiar challenge because... You're, you're dealing with someone you love so much who at so many junk, who in so many contexts, their history, their history has changed in their brain, they're a different person. Um, maybe just in kind of being a little stronger that has helped, but that, that really feels like a much, much different challenge. So here you are, you are the sort of consummate, sophisticated New Yorker, and all of a sudden, <laughs> But, You've never seen my furniture or my closet, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but you, um, and then this opportunity to move down south and take this completely unanticipated turn in your life, moving into academia. And you write, I'd, one of the reasons that you were looking for it is I'd seen that disability was navigable, taking people down different roads but not to dead ends. I mean, how, how open do you think you might have been to this kind of opportunity? Was it something you had always dreamed about or was this like off your map? It wasn't something I dream, dreamed about, it was something I thought about. I kind of had it um, in my head and I felt like I wanted to make a change in a couple of years. I'd been living in New York continuously for a long time. I, I'm someone who had hopped around a lot, not just in my job assignments, as you, as you noted in the introduction, but had hopped around a lot geographically. Um, and when this happened, I'd been living not only on the same street in Manhattan, but in the same uh, cooperative building for something like 16 years, which was completely out of character. And I felt like I had a, a change that I needed to make soon, I needed a new adventure. And this just accelerated the timetable. Because again, as with getting the dog, I kind of felt like, why am I like putting back things that I know I want to do? What is the point of that? I mean, we all do that. Um, sometimes we do it just because it's hard to rally and get the energy. Sometimes we do it because we live with this illusion, delusion that time is infinite. Um, I just knew I was going to do something like that. And it was, you know, like a lot of things in life, there was serendipity. I, I got an email one day from someone at Duke, and this was an ar area of the country that I loved and thought might be a perfect meld of quiet and, and cosmopolitanness. And I, you know, one day I opened my, my, my email, and in the inbox was an email from someone on a search committee at Duke telling me about a professorship that I never knew existed and telling me that it was open and that the deadline was in a week. And I thought, if the deadline is in a week, they don't have a surfeit of applications they like. So I think this fishing expedition all is saying your odds are really good here. So 
And so now, uh, now Frank is sort of training the next generation of journalists. Which is very frightening, yeah. Well, at a, you know, well, for the next generation and society right. at large, yeah. <laughs> but it is also at a moment when people don't. I mean, the media has trust in the media has deteriorated. The business of media is so unstable, so uncertain. I mean, so what are you trying to? instill in these students? Well, I mean, s some of the classes I teach are, are fairly straightforward writing workshops. So in that case, I'm just trying to do what I can um, with students who want to become better writers to make them better writers. But then there are also some overarching courses. And, um, you know, I taught a course, uh, I think it was last spring, called The News as Moral Battleground, which is a, a name for a course that different professors cycle into and, and make their own for the semester they're doing it. And the whole thing we looked at is we started, we started with Watergate, um, and we kind of ended in the present day. Um, right in the first class, I showed them what polls said about trust in the media, you know, in the 1970s, you know, after the Pentagon Papers, after Watergate. I had them watch uh, back to back for one assignment, the movie The Post, uh -huh. um, and All the President's Men. A and then I showed them the figures for what trust in the media was, and, and the plummet is astonishing, and the arc of the course was how did we get from there to here, but within that arc, we were talking about why it is so, such a danger, such a concern that we've gotten from here to here because of the role that journalism plays when, it's, when you see journalism at its best, when journalists are doing um, what it's most important for them to do, that is so vital. I mean, beginning with Watergate and the Pentagon Papers is also a way of beginning and saying, here's how valuable journalism was in holding a mirror up to things we needed to see and in prompting changes we needed to make. So I think I try to make them pause and think about the role and the vital importance of journalism in our society um, so that they can become smarter consumers of it and become better advocates for good journalism. And what do you think the future of journalism looks like? I don't know. What do you, I mean, you, you can answer that question. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'd love to hear your answer to that. You are, um, you probably have a more intelligent view of this than I do. I, I just, I don't know. It's just like every, Every time we think, I mean, it's it's a broken business model, and I think that that's driving a lot of other things, and you know, smart decisions by media management, and not so smart decisions sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, this is kind of a sideways non-answer to your question, but it's something I always like to take the opportunity to say because I'm assuming many of you in this room are um, regular and ardent consumers of journalism and media. Um, I always like to remind people that one of the most one of the biggest, most fundamental changes is that news organizations now can know exactly how you're consuming their product in a way they never did before. So, I mean, you'll remember when we began in this industry, the best idea that a newspaper had of what its readers wanted or what they were doing with the product was to convene essentially occasional focus groups, right? Um, and then to extrapolate obviously with a lot of inaccuracy from the information that that focus group um, provided. I mean, now I can go to a kind of internal thing at the New York Times, and I can find out exactly how many people have read like each of my recent columns, the average amount of time they spent, where in the column most of them dropped off, if they dropped off before the end, whether they came to that column via a smartphone, via a PC, whether they were following something from a search engine or whether they were, they were clicking from the home page. We know all of this. And what that means is when you are getting news that you don't like, or that's not the right way to put it, but when you're dissatisfied with the news you're getting from a publication, it's because you're, you're often getting the news that you've asked for. We all have a responsibility as news consumers to think about our consumption of the news as something that's actually gonna shape the news we get tomorrow and has an influence on the direction in which coverage goes. Uh, after the 2016 election, I'm sure you, like me, every time I appeared in public and it was open to questions, I got, why did you all write so much about Donald Trump? And I said, why did you all click so much? on what we wrote about Donald Trump. Because if people had clicked with that enthusiasm and in those numbers on John Kasich stories, we would have given them as many John Kasich stories as Trump stories. Now that doesn't reflect super well on us that we're making these decisions along those lines, but let's be realistic. Newspapers are a business. We will always have to make the decisions somewhat along those lines. And so I, I try as an individual consuming the news to bear that in mind and I think we all should. Yeah, and, and in addition to knowing, you know, 
how many people are reading your story at any given moment, where they came from before that, where they go to after that. You also get information of if they hit the paywall on your story, do they decide that they're going to pay yeah. for the subscription or not? And I must say that for us is also become a really important metric. It's like at what point are people so eager to read something That's that right. they are willing to pay for the newspaper. Right, and if you're someone who writes columns as we do, um, are you a columnist who gets people past the paywall? Do you actually bring in subscriptions or not? They can make that analysis of each person. And there's good news and bad news in that because I know, I bet everybody in the audience is thinking clickbait. Um, but in fact, sometimes it is our very, very best, deepest, hardest work that does it, you yeah. know? I mean, uh, but then... And sometimes it's just the latest Meghan Markle Harry story. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember we, ha we had one that just went off the charts, and it was, I think the headline was, I drove my Mercedes to the welfare office. <laughs> so, and somehow... That is, that is such a clickbait headline. <laughs> I <know. laughs> but I don't know, like, Car it's funny, when, 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 you and I, when you and I spoke at Duke, Karen was kind enough to come down and do a panel with me and Olivia Nuzzi at Duke. Um, and we talked about this with the audience, because a lot of people don't know it, but have you all ever heard of what A-B testing is? Some of you know. So, I mean, this is, you know, just kind of how sophisticated the technology and the, and the use of it has become. When we put something out, a column, a news story, um, we can put it out with multiple headlines and different online readers. Like, one-third will get headline A, one-third will get headline B, one-third will get headline C. And after an hour, they literally look at which of these headlines was the greatest honey trap for readers, right? And then that becomes the headline that goes on it and that all readers get. They will sometimes change a headline after six hours to kind of try to do a head fake and make readers think this is something they haven't read before, so they click on it again. Um, I mean, these are, these are, this is the kind of way the business is conducted these days. Course, some of us are reaching an age where we wouldn't remember we read it two hours ago. <laughs> so. <laughs> but, so, okay, so Frank Bruni has made his way through adversity. He has found life balance. He has reached this moment of great peace in his you life. You make me sound like the Buddha. I'm, <laughs> I'm setting you up. <laughs> and he decides, he decides on his next book project, which is the most obvious thing for someone <clears throat> in his position. He decides he's going to write a book on the politics of grievance that we are living in. Um, so tell us about that. Polarization, grievance, all the sort of things that have made our politics Yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm still in it, and so I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but it's a book that's sort of not sort of, it's a book that's on grievance culture and grievance politics and on my feeling, observation, and concern about the fact that so often we lead with grievance these days. You know, we, we, approach every, we approach our politics, we approach way too many life situations asking the question, how am I being shortchanged? Who's shortchanging me and what sort of recompense am I owed? And you see this filter, this lens everywhere once you look for it. I mean, I remember- I'm half Irish, we've been doing that for right. thousands of years. <laughs> But like, but but you see it. But, but what's what's interesting is is you see it. It travels across all political lines. It travels ac across all socioeconomic lines. I remember in a in a in a moment that was parsed and parsed and parsed ad nauseum. Something that no one ever said about the Will Smith Oscar slap and then the speech. Um, that was the thing that impressed me the most. Is so after he slaps Chris Rock and then he. Um, Nonetheless, you know, because these votes were already cast, and he deserved it very much, won the Best Actor Oscar for King Richard. He gets up on the stage. He does not apologize then. It's, it's a while before he issues anything that could be considered an appropriate and full-throated apology. If you watch that whole speech, it segues very quickly into a woe-is-me lament about how hard it is to be a celebrity today because people talk smack about you. And I thought to myself, we're looking at someone who just won the Oscar for Best Actor, who is one of the richest and most influential, someone who can get a movie greenlighted just by producing or starring in it, and he's asking me to feel sorry for him. But I thought, that's emblematic. Like, you see that everywhere once you start looking at it. So the book is, is basically my expression of concern about that, my investigation of why did we get to be this way. Um, I think it's a kind of confluence of narcissism and pessimism. Um, anyway, so that's what I'm working on. And it, 
does it relate to what I just did? No, but I mean, you you established in the introduction, like I am a total dilettante. You know, I mean, I I uh, I don't have a career. I've but you I've succeeded I don't have at a everything. So no, I don't. But um, but I mean, I just I I'm really. I mean, talk about blessings. I have been so lucky that um, when my curiosity has pointed me in a new direction. There has always been someone there who is willing to give me at least a modest book advance or, you know, let me write about it in a column. And it may take me longer to write and I may have more typos to correct. But the fact that people still let me write and read what I write, I mean, that's the thing to focus on and be grateful for. So what about our, yes. <laughs> this is, but the, something has, it just feels like something has settled in on society. And I certainly, you know, I began covering politics decades ago. And I just don't remember that everything at the beginning was so zero sum. Yeah. You know, if you get it, you're taking it yeah, from exactly. me. Yeah, exactly. That's the pessimism I'm talking about, yeah. But how do we fix that? Because I'd until we get sort of a common, a, a, an idea that we're all in this together and if we, you know, rising tide lifts all boats and- I was just thinking that, yeah. Uh, how did we lose that and how do we get it back? I don't know how we get it back, and that's the kind of that's the spade work on the book I still have to do because I think I shouldn't just leave people <laughs> feeling <laughs> really down <laughs> and hopeless. Um, but I mean, there has been in, in a in a world where we comment and over comment on everything. I don't think we've actually fully appraised and appreciated what a fundamental turn there has been in the American character and the American psyche from optimism to pessimism. You know, you go back decades and if you asked parents, do you think your children will have a better life than, than you did? A question that was usually asked and interpreted as meaning economics, clear majority said yes, of course, that's changed. That's a really big shift. You go back to, um, you know, you wrote the definitive wonderful book about Nancy Reagan. You go back to the Reagan years and the whole morning in America, um, you know, famous line of his. There was a truism, correct me if you think I'm wrong because you're more of an expert on this than I am, um, but there was a kind of truism that took hold in politics after Ronald Reagan that the more optimistic candidate won, you know, that optimism was the thing you had to ace. You look at the people on the political rise today and what they're talking about is who our enemies are, how we're gonna get even with our enemies. It's a completely different tone. Donald Trump, whatever else you think of him, was not elected on optimism. He was elected on pessimism and resentment. Ron DeSantis, who's a very interesting political figure, has many strengths and there's some stuff to admire about him. What's most distinctive about him is the length of his enemies list and the methodical way in which he goes through those enemies, making sure he has gotten even with them. Um, that's a fundamental shift in, 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 in our politics, I think. Do you agree or? Yeah, and I think people, and again, going back to the Reagan years, which I had to go relive for several years to get my book done. Um, you know, it does seem like his critics miss, I mean, like they would go, oh, that's just trickle down economics. And they didn't realize most of the country was saying, Really, that's going to trickle down, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Let me get my bucket, right? right. <laughs> so, and I, th there was a, and to me, the change, I mean, there, it, it, there was obviously building, and, you know, the, there were things that went on in the Reagan years that we're still living with. There were things that went on, you know, the people who came to Capitol Hill with the, when the House flipped in 1994 were, you know, we talked in terms of it being a revolution. and But I really do think that the big change, a big change that has never been recognized to the degree it should, is when the Tea Party people mm. hit Capitol Hill in the 2010 election and the 2012 election. Because these were people who had run explicitly not on what they were going to get done, but on what they were going to stop. And certainly it is their heirs that you now see in the Congress, like something, I just, I just did the calculation and I wish I had it in front of me, but something like over 80% of the members of the current House of Representatives were elected since 2010. Yeah. Meaning they are part of the Republican members and that they are really part of this part of this generation where you go home and what you deliver to your constituents is not what you got done, but what you have stopped. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is such a fundamental 
sort of shift in how people are measured. And maybe it's because of what kind of districts we have now or what, but. But it's, it's, it's a problem. Should we, um, I think I they, would say, why they started we get, that late, so I think yes. let's, let's so, have people. Yeah, do, so I would, we would love to go to questions, and if you have any, and I, I'm gonna repeat the question, not because I'm slow, but because <laughs> they need to uh, get a record of them here. So yes, ma'am. Ooh, um, I mean, we're still figuring that out. And it's, it's so, it, it's so oh, sorry, the question, sorry. What, I, I'll repeat it if you want. Um, oh, sure. Uh, she asked yes, how a AI is gonna affect us as journalists. Um, I mean, we're still figuring that out. I mean, to, to, to the extent that four weeks ago, all of the stories everyone was writing was about um, the things that a chat bot was capable of and how difficult it could be to, to detect. In the last week, I'm reading all these stories about how now there's stuff that's been developed to detect the chatbot. So it's so hard to figure out, like it seems like the, the technology may solve the very problem that it created. This is such a moving target that it's really, I think, just impossible to know. And that's, that's what that illustrates. What would you say? Yeah, I mean, it's just like, I don't know if we're gonna think it was like the greatest blessing or, you know, you know, I don't know. I, I would. So do you feel like as a professor that you, you are in a situation where you could tell whether somebody wrote their own paper or? I don't know that I'll be able to tell, but I played enough around, I played around enough with the chat bot that as I've told my students, you could probably chat bot your way through the course to a B or a B plus, you know? Mm -hmm. But the chat bot doesn't produce stuff that's original, spirited, vivid enough, like that you're not gonna chat bot your way to an A minus and an A. And, I don't know how much time you've spent on elite college campuses these days, but a B plus is practically a failing grade. It's like no, you know, like it, that's 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 literally cause to go to student health center and, you know, um, I mean, so I've just said to them, you know, I'm, I'll be looking out for it. If I find out you've used a chat bot, that's going to be an F on your paper. But you know, if you find that you can successfully conceal that and chat bot your way through the semester, you're only gonna chat bot your way to a B plus because I've looked at the, you know, if you wanna do that and waste your time and not learn anything, mazel, you know, but uh, I, th I think it's a wasted opportunity, you know? So, anyway, uh, yes ma'am. This is the demise of the local newspaper, which I personally think is the single most dangerous thing that has happened in journalism. Yeah, no, oh. and, and you're absolutely right. It's dangerous even in ways that people don't, don't immediately think of. When you look at why do people have less trust in, less respect for journalists than they did back in the Watergate days, one of the reasons is with the death of local news, the news is being produced so far from them by such abstractions, it's sort of like dealing with people digitally rather than face to face, that you don't have journalists in your life and your community who reassure you that this is an honorable practice done by earnest, well-intentioned people. Um, it's a huge problem, but I will, I will say, because I, I want to be hopeful about some stuff at least, if not grievance this, um, there are really interesting things happening all over the country. Um, in North Carolina, um, a publication, I'm putting that in quotes because it's on the web called The Assembly that didn't exist just three years ago, is devoted entirely to North Carolina news. It's growing um, because it has really creative people working for it. Um, it is supported, it, it has a sort of subscription model that's different from the, the old newspaper subscription model. There's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. There's some philanth philanthropy going towards this. And so I think there are some, there are some things growing that may make this a little better. Do you agree, agree here? I, I hope so, but I'm, I'm suspicious a little bit of the foundation model. I mean, I would love to see if they could come up with some way for local journalism to make a profit in the digital age. And the problem is getting enough scale for it to do that. Well, one possibility, and it's, ha it's happening a little bit at Duke, is there's a publication put out by students who, we don't have a journalism department, but we do have journalism courses. And there's a publication put out by students who take those courses called the Ninth Street Journal. Um, and as coverage of the city of Durham is, has declined in terms of traditional media, the Ninth Street Journal is doing court coverage, it's doing political coverage. We have 
all of these incredibly bright and uh, energetic students around the country who are often in, at universities, at schools where local papers are dying or have died, I think there's, a, there's some promise in having journalism education and the students studying it do some of the fill-in for those missing local journalists and that missing coverage. So great. Yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> Well, um, thank, thank you. It's great. Thank you for reading the book. I really appreciate it. Um, and the, the question is how he was able to find some of these amazing people that he writes about. Um, some of it, honestly, was a cheat. And what I mean by that is um, when I had written my book on the college admissions mania, that grew out of a column I'd written saying this has gotten out of control. And I'd never gotten so many reader emails. Um, for a column that I'd written. And I'm not, normally, uh, I'm not normally good on the fly or a very bright person, but I immediately realized I'm gonna save all of these because there's practically an entire book's worth of interviews in my inbox. I wrote, before I, before I began working on this book in earnest, before I had a contract for it or thought it would be a book, I wrote a long cover story for the Sunday review section of the Times about what I'd been through. Um, and those same sorts of emails started coming in, and I saved them, and I would often email people back. Everybody that I asked to talk to wanted to talk. We, we often, and this is another thing I'd love for you to take away, um, we often don't ask people around us about the struggles that we know they're going through, or we see them going through. Maybe we don't want the responsibility of taking in that knowledge, but often I think we mistake that for courtesy. Like, we don't want to be invasive. We don't want to put them on the spot. I have found most people actually want to know that you see that, um, and they have some stuff they'd like to talk about that they've never had an opportunity to. Um, but I also just decided whenever I cross paths with someone who said something that I wouldn't have heard in my earlier life because I wasn't as sensitive to this, I would follow up. So I went and gave a speech at a Southern University um, when the university president's wife was late in greeting me and said, I'm sorry, I've been dealing with some health stuff. And instead of saying, I'm so sorry to hear that, I said, oh, if you don't mind, what have you been going through? And out came the whole story. I went for a weekend in Las Vegas, uh, just to kind of, uh, with a friend, just to have some fun. And I went to a restaurant, and since I'm no longer a restaurant critic, I can reserve in my own name. Some, the, the manager recognized my name, he came by, and I could see just by looking at him, there was something very off about his eyes. And he didn't do the normal thing that happens to me in restaurants, which is, oh, I used to like reading your restaurant reviews. We hope you like your meal. He said, what you've written in the Times about your eyes was really meaningful to me because I've had a pretty, since, child, since my childhood, I've had a, a really kind of um, intense medical odyssey with my eyes. I woke up the next morning. I called the restaurant. Um, and I said, uh, I'd really love to follow up with the manager who spoke to me. I'd love to hear his story if he's willing. And his story is three pages of the book. And I just did that again and again. Yeah, there's some amazing stories in there. I think we probably have time for only maybe one more question. Uh, yes, sir. This is a thanking him for his columns about LGBTQ people. Yeah, thank well. Yes. Thank you for reading them. No, I mean it, it's um, uh, it's 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 just such a privilege to be read, and so thank you. Well, great. And any okay, let's do one more. Anybody? Oh, yes, ma'am. This is keeping uh, hard copy sources as a matter of record. And yes. 
So you're actually high up in, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt. Um, <laughs> but no, but seriously, Karen is actually high up in newspaper management. You will have a much more informed answer about this than I will. I agree with you that that makes me very nervous too. And I can tell you one quick funny story about that. Um, our editor, our executive editor who just left, retired, was a guy named Marty Barron, who was also a, um, a, a major character in the best picture of the year spotlight when he was at the Boston Globe. So um, the movie comes out, it wins the Academy Award, we're all thrilled, but there is this, this moment in the movie Spotlight where they're trying to track down all these Catholic priests and who've moved around all over the place. And you see these Boston Globe reporters going through all these old, old church directories, you know, through these musty old books. And one of our researchers, uh, we're having a staff meeting and Marty's in there. And she says, I was really struck by that scene in Spotlight. She says, you know, when we moved from our old building to our new building last year, we got rid of all of our old directories, so we wouldn't be able to do something like this. And I do, I, I worry about that, and you're right. Also, in the digital world where, you know, keywords are so fluid, and I, I don't know how research is, I mean, those of us who, you know, got started in this business before there was a Google, uh, really appreciate what technology has delivered. But yeah, there is something about being able to find old things that disappear into the, into the mists. But anyway, I, um, I think we have run out of time here. So I just wanna go ahead and thank you, Frank, for this book and everything else you do. I wanna, I wanna thank you and thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.